Hola a tothom. Anem a continuar amb la sessió d'avui. A continuació, i com ha comentat l'Aurèlia, en comptes de fer la ponència del Peter Stone, que la passem a última hora del matí, comencem amb la taula d'experiències i així ens serveix una mica per connectar les fantàstiques reflexions que ens ha fet el Jordi Armadans. Doncs les connectarem amb amb casos reals, amb la realitat i amb experiències que s'estan adduent a terme des de l'àmbit del patrimoni. Aquesta taula d'experiències participarà en primer lloc l'Anastàcia Xeret-Nitxenko. L'Anastàcia és doctora en Història i vicepresidenta d'ICOM Ucraïna. Museòloga i historiadora especialitzada en el patrimoni cultural ucraïnès durant la República Soviètica d'Ucraïna. És autora de diverses publicacions sobre història dels museus, ha dirigit diferents projectes de digitalització de col·leccions i de documents d'arxiu, ha treballat en accions de formació per a professionals dels museus i en la implementació d'indicadors clau per als museus d'Ucraïna. Des de l'any 2020 és directora de projectes del Museu Nacional d'Art de Cultura i de l'Arsenal del Mr. Tic a Kiev. Gràcies de tot cor, Anastàcia, per estar aquí amb nosaltres i acompanyar-nos perquè sabem que no ha sigut fàcil poder arribar fins aquí. Endavant, Anastàcia. Gràcies molt. Hola. Moltes gràcies per l'invitació. Gràcies molt. I ara em treballo... Ok. Um, the first part of my presentation is going to be about the main reason why Ukrainian uh, culture heritage is a uh, great risk and destroyed. And I would uh, uh, want uh, to be very clear, it's invasion of Russia, the main reason of this. And um, uh, here is a map of Ukraine with uh, liberated territories uh, are marked uh, here in blue. And uh, here is still occupied territories, uh, a market with two colors. As you can see, a light pink is occupied this year and uh, still uh, temporarily occupied. And dark pink uh, is occupied in uh, 2014, partly Donetsk, Luhansk region, and uh, Crimea. Uh, and um, here is uh, the, some statistic on uh, damages uh, from the Ministry of Culture uh, of Ukraine. UNESCO is receiving uh, and verifying information regarding uh, the, the uh, destruction. The temporary um, difference between uh, uh, the data of uh, the Ukrainian Minister of Culture and UNESCO due to the long verification uh, process. Um, what I can say that our Russian started to destroy museum in February and March. Uh, with different types of weapons, uh, in particular with artillery, missiles, etc., when they were still near Kyiv and uh, in the central and uh, northern parts of Ukraine. And here are some uh, examples. It's um, March, uh, uh, and some central part uh, of Ukraine. Uh, city Mariupol uh, is completely destroyed. And um, this is museum uh, was uh, uh, shelled by um, Russian missiles. It's uh, museums of great philosopher, uh, Ukrainian philosopher, or Grigory Skovrodam. And um, at the moment, uh, Ukrainian's entire territory is being blasted with missiles and drones. And museums in Kyiv were last affected on October 10th. And what I uh, would like also stress that uh, the Russian invaders, uh, they wanted to destroy um, cultural testimony uh, uh, to Ukrainian uh, identity. It's, uh, these pictures are real. It's uh, they burned um, Ukrainian books and they want, uh, they shelled uh, very famous and uh, national symbols of Ukrainian. Um, but uh, the cultural heritage is both destroyed and looted by Russians. During the advance and retreat of Russian soldiers in March, 
There were different individual incidents uh, of museums looting. From this museum of uh, uh, the Zaporozhye regions, um, the Russian soldiers looted office equipment, and this is a museum um, item. It's, um, uh, sorry to say, it's marble toilet from 19th century. But now collections uh, are being removed in land, uh, large numbers in Ukraine's temporarily occupied territory. Museum objects were removed from Mariupol. And for example, uh, Kithian gold was moved uh, from the temporarily occupied Melitopol. Collections were also stolen from uh, Kherson, both uh, museums. Uh, and the, uh, as you know, Kherson, uh, uh, which uh, now uh, liberated. And uh, the collection, uh, Museum of Ukrainian collection, are being transported to various occupied parts of Ukraine, included Crimea, with the possibility of further, uh, further trans uh, transit to Russian Federation museums. Um, also on the occupied territory, Russian armed forces and members of the occupation uh, authorities have pressured at punishment on museum professionals and even their families. Uh, people were kidnapped uh, and interagent. Um, museum professionals were forced to collaborate uh, and tell where the collection located in purpose to transfer those collections. Um, and uh, what I uh, would like to say is that cultural heritage looting is not an accident. It's a purposeful policy of the Russian Federation. Um, the signing on September of such called agreement of, uh, on the annexation for uh, Ukrainian regions, uh, Donetsk, Luhansk, Kherson, and Zaporizhia, by the RF president, which was also approved by uh, State Duma. Um, it's actually a public uh, affirmation of the existence of such policy. As a result of this, following the signing of this document, Russian experts began to publish estimates of how much the Russian Federation Museum's fund would be enriched at the cost of the Russian Museum, uh, of the art, sorry, of the art museums of Donetsk, Luhansk, Zaporozhye, and Kherson. And uh, I mentioned that Kherson uh, looted uh, by now. And in this case, for Russian professionals, the monetary uh, equivalent is more important than the cultural values. This is uh, from um, Russian media Izvestia uh, quotation. Uh, at the same time, the policy uh, addressing Ukrainian culture heritage uh, is not a uh, new practice. Russia uh, has used it since uh, 2014. Following the annexation of Crimea and partial occupation uh, of the Donetsk and Luhansk region, region uh, since uh, 2014, cultural heritage has been removed from U uh, Crimean museums. Pieces of art and archaeological objects have been transferred uh, to Russian museums. And uh, um, I would like to underline that the heritage of Crimean in indigenous uh, peoples like Crimean Tatars, Kar uh, Karaims, and Kremchaks has also suffered uh, in this way. Uh, however, the predatory uh, political tendency, appropriation of cultural heritage, they uh, date back uh, in the uh, Russian Empire and Soviet Union. Due to the colonial strategy in the 19th and 20th century, numerous examples of cultural values uh, were removed to Russian museums from Ukraine, Estonia, Latvia, Latvia, uh, Georgia, and the other, other uh, nations what uh, was part of uh, the Soviet Union. Uh, unfortunately, today, uh, Russian museums also show support for this colonial policy and they implement it at their level. There is an um, organization of an exhibition and a pseudo museum project as a means of propaganda, cover up, and justification of war, xenophobia, and neoliberalism. Uh, Russian museums uh, staff take part in calculation the value of Ukrainian museum collection and in a in illegally transferring, openly expressing their support for the war against Ukraine, they recognize the museum activities of Russian museums as a part uh, of uh, so-called special operation in Europe as well. 
Additionally, the ICOM of Russia um, did not uh, officially define its position it, and didn't condemn the destruction and transportation of the cultural heritage of Ukraine. Meanwhile, the president of Russia, ICOM, uh, Mikhail Sholokhov, is a member of state Duma from the main part of Russia. He, uh, for example, he voted in particular for uh, the annexation of uh, four regions of Ukraine. And thus, uh, actually, he, uh, support of policy uh, of uh, appropriation Ukrainian uh, cultural heritage. All that clear upon the Russian ICOM members and uh, the museum professional community community's position. And um, what about Ukraine? Um, from uh, 24 February, uh, part of the Ukrainian museum's uh, staff joined uh, um, Ukrainian military services, service, and many museum sp uh, specialist uh, women, of course, flee, um, and they became, uh, became refugees. Part uh, of them moved uh, to relatively uh, safe parts of the country, and um, not uh, all of them uh, have the opportunity to work in their profession right now. And also, unfortunately, we also have uh, casualties among the museum professionals. Um, right now, uh, Ukrainian museums are facing, uh, facing uh, uh, survival issues. Uh, most of, uh, important, most important uh, it's to keep teams and save people, of course, and then collections. During the war, museum collections are, uh, are packed and hidden uh, because uh, 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 missile strikes uh, hit the entire uh, territory of Ukraine. So um, I think we should rec uh, reconsider uh, museum activities uh, within each institution. Uh, what uh, to do now and how to proceed after the war, actually. Um, of course, uh, for us, uh, winter preparation is crucial. After all, all um, Russians' goals is to destroy Ukrainian uh, electricity infrastructure and leave the Ukrainian people without light and heat. Uh, museums now attempt um, uh, to operate in the midst of, uh, of power uh, sh uh, shortage. Uh, and uh, um, regular blackouts, uh, now it's norm in Kyiv and other parts of Ukraine, for offices and uh, houses as well. And um, what actually uh, Ukrainian museums professionals do? They monitor the museum collection and have developed a program for international aid distribution and mutual aid development. Um, of course, um, be frankly, it's impossible to prevent destruction uh, of heritage during uh, the war. At the same time, how to play it? Okay. Um, it's supposed to be. Uh, um, it, um, it, we, we're not able to, to prevent uh, destruction, but uh, right now we uh, um, take some loss assessment measures uh, for, further, uh, for further criminal procedures. Uh, and also um, in cooperation with uh, ICOM uh, Secretariat, Heritage Protection Department, and Ukrainian museum experts, we uh, compiled a red list of uh, Ukrainian heritage at risk. Um, the main goal uh, of it is uh, to draw attention uh, of the world community what is happening right now with cultural heritage in Ukraine. It's also plans uh, to launch uh, an international monitoring group from ICOM, whose members will uh, monitor and report gross violation by Russian museum uh, staff, such uh, organizing propaganda exhibitions, collaborating with illegal transfer uh, of Ukrainian museum collection, etc. And um, I, I would like to stress that um, Collaboration and cooperation with international community is uh, are crucial. And right now, I'm not talking about only uh, about uh, materials aid and financial support. Uh, for this, uh, we really grateful, and especially for uh, our Spanish friend, uh, our uh, ICOM of Spain and the Spanish museums. Thank you, thank you so much.
Um, but I also talking about engagement and talking uh, um, in the taking proper actions to create a secure common future. It's really important to um, develop and stick uh, to safe, uh, safety rules and protocols. For example, in Ukrainian uh, cities, cultural heritage is more actively marked with blue shield science. Uh, however, uh, Russian Federation uh, violates any protocols and in international law. They ruin humanitarian infrastructure and destroy cultural uh, heritage. Um, I think as a result, it's clear that risk posed by Russian threat uh, must be reconsid uh, reconsidered right now. Um, right now, one uh, cannot go living as before. Uh, believing that it's simply conflict uh, between Russia Federation and Ukraine, it's uh, this it. Um, we're thinking that uh, we should recognize a um, new uh, confrontation with the so-called new uh, axis of evil. Um, I also think, in, uh, think uh, that it's impossible uh, to stick old ag agenda and museum professionals also should uh, start uh, talk with uh, their visitors about new realities. Uh, thank you so much for your attention. Gracias. Muchas gracias, Anastasia. Eh, las preguntas que le voy a hacer las pasaremos al final de la tabla de experiencias para si no no enterraré. Eh, Don un paso a continuación a Lisbeth Sabrín. Eh, Lisbeth es doctor en gestión de patrimonio cultural y presidente en de Heritage for Peace. Arqueòleg sirià especialitzat en la gestió del patrimoni cultural, membre de l'equip sirià espanyol del CSIC i investigador de la institució Milà i Fontanals de Recerca en Humanitats del CSIC. És president també i cofundador de l'ONG Internacional Heritage for Peace, que lidera iniciatives com ABUAP, un projecte social amb el patrimoni, com a eina de diàleg intercultural amb refugiats i immigrants de l'Orient Mitjà i del nord d'Àfrica i la xarxa d'àrab d'organitzacions de la societat civil per a la salvaguarda del patrimoni cultural, amb treballs a Síria, l'Iraq, Líbia, el Iemen, per identificar, gestionar i planificar i conservar jaciments arqueològics, monuments històrics, museus i altres recursos del patrimoni cultural. Per tant, us deixo també amb una persona que, eh, manauradament, ha treballat també en territoris en, en situació de ple conflicte. Endavant, és breu. Moltes gràcies. Bon dia a tothom i, i tinc, bueno, estic content de, uh, de estar aquí i parlar en aquesta xerrada. Jo crec que estem sempre acostumbrats a parlar d'aquests temes a fora, però bueno, estic molt content per poder organitzar, estar amb vosaltres en aquesta xerrada. I, i bueno, gràcies per tothom per tot l'esforç que he fet per organitzar aquesta uh, jornada, que és un tòpic molt important en l'actualitat. I, bueno, primer de tot, eh, quan parlem de conflictes eh, i la producció del patrimoni, sempre la gent diu que, bueno, la gent està morint i com podem treballar, treballar per la producció del patrimoni si hi ha vides humanes que estan eh, verdent. I, bueno, el patrimoni, i quan vam començar aquesta tarea, fa ara portem quasi més de deu anys, vaig començar per, per una història personal. Jo soc sirià, visquem aquí, i mirant tot el que ha passat a Síria, i cal actuar i fer alguna cosa eh, per, per ajudar el meu país. I, i per veure com ha canviat la, el món amb actualitzant aquestes coses, ja des de quan ja va començar la guerra síria fins ara la situació ha canviat molt. Que eh, nosaltres ja hem vist últimament que hi ha molts canvis i bueno, aquests canvis ja vivim ara en el conflicte ucranià que el món està molt més sensibilitzat sobre aquests temes. Bueno, bàsicament 
bueno, valor una amiga de la nuestra feina y que esté en la actualidad, en los nuestros proyectos y, y bueno, con STEM también trabajan utilizando el patrimonio cultural ver eh, construir la PAU. Ha sido la nuestra filosofía, ha sido la nuestra misión cuando va a comenzar que el patrimonio es una idea importante para construir la PAU. Nosotros somos una organización bueno, fundada aquí desde 2013, una organización, eh, bueno, básicamente era a muchos voluntarios de todo el mundo. Tenían gente que, bueno, de varios países y, y gracias a que estos voluntarios van a construir la nuestra feina. Bueno, eh, eh, la nuestra organización Patrimonio y Perlapau va a comenzar con la necesidad de hacer algo en Siria. Y desde el principio la nuestra uh, misión era ayudar el, 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 uh, la gente que trabaja el patrimonio por el tema de la protección del patrimonio. Uh, bueno, y siempre vamos a ser neutral. Y trabajar en un conflicto uh, y ser neutral no es fácil. Por tanto, uh, la nuestra neutralidad a vegades, uh, no es fácil mantenerla durante los conflictos. Y bueno, después ya voy a hablar cómo estén superando estas cosas. Bueno, básicamente, eh, bueno, aquí, aquí estas son una mica de nuestros objetivos, trabajar y, y, y eh, desde cuando vamos a comenzar, pues la nuestra gran eh, concentración va a ayudar a la sociedad civil y sobre todo los conflictos actuales han mostrar que ya muchas dificultades de zonas, sobre todo, yo hablo del caso de Siria, también eh, Yemen y Libia, ya zonas on eh, no ni estat, ya, ya separistas, o también el caso de Ucrania, pero aquellas partes que son de aquellos conflictos que no tienen la Uh, el soporte internacional. Yo, yo no hablo de, de stats, yo hablo de sociedad civil que están en regiones no reconocidas internacionalmente. Y bueno, por ejemplo, en el caso de Siria, vamos a trabajar en la zona de Edlep, ahora estamos trabajando en la zona donde está el norte de Siria, donde está también uh, bueno, el, 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 el Skurz. Y bueno, a Yemen estamos trabajando también en el norte, donde está el gobierno del Houthi, que no está reconocido internacionalmente. Y, y, y también el caso de Libia, estamos en el list de Libia, Amgen, Am sociedad civil de allí. Perdón, la nuestra feina está, bueno, desde a lo largo de esta de años de vida aquí en Cataluña, y, 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 y bueno, estamos uh, uh, construidos. Am una am la ley de, de las organizaciones non, non de profit catalana, vamos a poder implementar varios proyectos. Y ahora no hay espacio de hablar de todos los proyectos, pero bueno, hablo una mica de, una mica de la actualidad y de las cosas que estén en ahora. Durante el conflicto, So, bueno, sobre todo con el país, Siria, Irak, Yemen, Libia, han tenido, bueno, desgraciadamente, mucha, mucha destrucción del patrimonio. Aquí podemos ver aquí esta foto, una saque de yogs arqueológicos, eh, 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 sobre todo, bueno, el saque de los, eh, y la destrucción también, eh, 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 intención que pase muy eh, brutal en París y que también se han declarado patrimonio de la humanidad, como Alepo, como Palmira, como, bueno, aquí, bueno, tenemos aquí esta eh, eh, foto y la eh, del Estado Islámico, todo el mundo, vosotros recordéis aquí esta foto brutal del Museo de Musel, eh, el, 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 el saqueo y la destrucción del Museo de Taz, a Yemen. Bueno, en todo caso, eh, todas estas y Mirán, y está trabajando en aquellas años, bueno, van a ver la necesidad de crear una uh, uh, iniciativa que agrupa las sociedades civiles en uh, países de conflicto en la zona árabe. Y van a crear la uh, uh, red árabe de la sociedad civil para la protección del patrimonio que años. Van a crear aquí a Barcelona, hace casi tres años, van a venir representantes 
de, bueno, de todos muchos ONGs en aquellos países. Y, y, y bueno, y en, en esta uh, uh, red, pues trabajamos implementando varios proyectos. Uh, bueno, tenemos eh, esta iniciativa para crear con el soporte de la Alianza de la Producción del Patrimonio, que es el Alif, que está en Ginebra. Bueno, y, 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 y todo eso, bueno, Alif, por ejemplo, y también ya la, 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 eh, la, el Fondo Inglés de la Producción del Patrimonio del, 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 eh, del Bridge Council, todas estas iniciativas bueno, van a crear en los últimos cinco años. Por tanto, la situación al principio va a ser muy, muy difícil trabajar porque no había fondos de esta cosa. Y el escenario internacional va a cambiar desde cuando van crear todas uh, estas uh, dos uh, uh, fundaciones que están ayudando para dar un soporte económico al, al, uh, a la producción del patrimonio. Bueno, la, la red ARA, pues, bueno, nosotros siempre pensamos que la sociedad civil necesita tener más especialidad, necesita soporte, sobre todo porque uh, la UNESCO y todas las organizaciones internacionales no más pueden trabajar en la Uh, los gobiernos reconocidos internacionalmente. Y la sociedad civil, como había dicho, y hay un problema también de ley internacional que todas las convenciones de la UNESCO uh, no más están en uh, uh, gobiernos reconocidos internacionalmente. Y, 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 y eso es un gran dilema que tenemos, que a veces las zonas o no hay, o no hay gobiernos reconocidos, pues eso pues, es muy difícil trabajar porque la ley internacional no me es de, uh, de tratar de uh, uh, trabajar en países reconocidos uh, internacionalmente. Aquí son una amiga de las nuestras uh, uh, ONGs que están en, bueno, en Siria, en Yemen, Libia. Bueno, a través de esta red van a hacer varios proyectos. No hay tiempo para hablar todo en, 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 en el en detalle de este proyecto, por ejemplo, este proyecto de uh, Bacton, pues es una uh, uh, aplicación para crear, para ayudar y donar a activistas, a gente del patrimonio que trabaja en conflictos para documentar el, 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 el daño y también el, las cosas robadas del, del patrimonio. Por ejemplo, este es un proyecto que se hará acabar uh, también con un soporte de la Fundación Alemana Gerda Henkel. Aquesta, es per imams. Nosotros vamos a uh, formar y en este proyecto que ya uh, uh, una recerca está feita sobre la relación entre el Islam y el patrimonio, en el cual el, 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 bueno, la idea también es sensibilizar y crear una aina um, per los imams y la sociedad civil, en el cual los imams pueden sensibilizar sobre la producción y sobre la importancia del patrimonio. Bueno, eso, bueno, nos ha tratado de tres uh, áreas de, uh, de, de ley, la ley internacional, la ley islámica y la ley doméstica del patrimonio. Y, 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 y además, bueno, será un e-learning en árabe también y bueno, de facilidad a varios países donde ya uh, hay ese problema en la discusión del patrimonio. Bueno. Uh, bueno, ya muchas cosas para explicar, pero bueno, ya muy corté pues una mica de todos los proyectos. Uh, bueno, como he visto que la, el Estado Islámico va a estar brutal, va a hacer muchas destrucciones a Siria y Irak, y, y, y nosotros ahora hace tres años trabajamos en Raqqa. El Raqqa va a ser el capital del Estado Islámico. Bueno, del 2014 a fines del 2017, y van, bueno, va a sufrir mucha destrucción de patrimonio y hay muchas cosas que, 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 que van a destruir. Y nosotras, bueno, van a crear, bueno, desde 2020, trabajamos para documentar y uh, 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 también hacer intervención de emergencia para, para el patrimonio a, a Raqqa. Bueno, uh, um, bueno, después pues, ya hay un uh, vídeo que se puede usar para uh, explicar cómo, cómo estaba Raqqa. En todo caso, uh, también, como he visto, que la, 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 uh, el Estado Islámico va a utilizar los objetos arqueológicos y la, uh, la, la, uh, uh, el tráfico de antigüedad para financiar la seva guerra. Nosotros, en, uh, 
en aquests temps amb el recerc que vas fer amb el professor Neil Brody de la Universitat d'Oxford i la gent amb Síria, vam buscar com podem entendre la relació entre l'estat islàmic i el saqueig i el comerç del tràfic d'antiguitat. Nosaltres el que hem fet buscar els arxius de l'Estat Islàmic. Aquí està el Ministeri d'Economia de l'Estat Islàmic, la gent que està treballant amb nosaltres. Vam buscar els arxius. Aquí vam identificar molts objectes que estan ara en el mercat d'antiguitat, que estan venuts il·legalment. Totes aquestes són objectes que tenen 4 o 5 mil anys de la ciutat de Mari a Síria, que és a l'Iufrate. Vam documentar molts objectes que estan perdut en el mercat il·legal. A més a més, aquests són documents de l'arxiu que vam trobar aquests documents mostren com organitza l'Estat Islàmic el saqueig i la venda de tràfic d'antiguitats. A més a més, aquí hem fet a Raqqa una ciutat destruïda amb la guerra, amb també la gent està al terreny, ha sofert molt amb el terrorisme, aquí vam crear amb aquesta iniciativa Rafiqatuna diverses campanyes de sensibilització. Fem comparació amb el cas ucranià. Aquí vam aprendre una cosa, una elecció molt important, que quan treballem per construir alguna cosa després de la guerra, Raqqa ha sofert molt. El patrimoni és una eina per construir la gent. Per exemple, amb la sensibilització d'aquests nanos que estan en aquesta... Podem veure com la gent ha recuperat el seu autoestima, ha recuperat la seva identitat, que una identitat estava molt amansada per el terrorisme. I els projectes de construcció, amb aquest projecte que estem fent, són com ajuda humanitària. És a dir, amb aquests projectes vam crear quasi 100 postos de feina durant aquests dos anys. La gent, i no vam reconstruir o rehabilitar grans edificis, no. Els edificis que vam reconstruir també amb una... Aquest projecte també va ser amb una col·laboració amb una ONG aquí a Barcelona, Riapimet. Els projectes són d'ajuda immediata a la societat que la gent, Arraca, el que vam rehabilitar és un madafa, que és una casa per la gent de la ciutat. La importància que ha actuat de la rehabilitació del patrimoni cal crear un benefici immediat a la societat. I això és el que és una elecció que esperem que en el cas d'Ucrania que poden crear coses que beneficiï la comunitat directament. Això és un vídeo, no sé si podem posar un minut, però un vídeo mostra com ha sigut Raqqa. No sé si es pot posar, però no hi ha problema si no es pot posar. Com estava Raqqa no n'hi ha problema. Com estava Raqqa ara destruïda amb tot el que ha fet l'estat islàmic. Una altra cosa que vull parlar, la importància de pensar en els refugiats. Nosaltres, al cas de Síria, tenim ara quasi 50% de la gent que són refugiats, dins del país o a fora, molt important, molt important pensar en refugiats. I aquí, en el cas de Palmira, nosaltres vam... Tothom parla de Palmira, tothom heu sentit Palmira i la destrucció de Palmira en els mitjans, però ningú parlava de la gent de Palmira. Tota la gent de Palmira que estava refugiada i ha deixat Palmira. 
Nosaltres aquesta iniciativa Palmir Invoice, els peus de Palmira, vam pensar que és molt important crear una veu a la gent de Palmira amb la qual amb la qual aquesta gent pot participar en la reconstrucció de Palmira, pot participar i ajuda a ells. I aquesta iniciativa ho vam crear amb refugiats de Palmira que són a Turquia. Nosaltres, i sobretot, la idea de crear feina i de... I vam identificar 15 artesans, amb aquests artesans ho vam donar fons amb la qual poden produir la seva artesania i vendre. I, bueno, tenen un mercat, hi ha un mercat aquí en la pàgina web, el shop, amb la qual es pot comprar productes. I la idea també és pensar en aquest patrimoni immaterial, no més pensar en el patrimoni material, també el patrimoni immaterial. Parlant de refugiats, no em parlo de la destrucció d'Ucraïna, també nosaltres fa quan va començar la guerra a Ucraïna vam crear una iniciativa de la nostra organització per Ucraïna. I amb aquesta iniciativa vam fer diverses coses diverses formacions, sobretot amb la nostra experiència, amb gent que treballa en museus o gent que treballa i treballa molt a prop d'on la iniciativa HERI, que és la iniciativa de l'emergència de la producció del patrimoni que estan del Museu de Maidan a Kiev. Últimament, molt cortet, vull parlar de com nosaltres també pensem en els refugiats fa Fa quasi quatre anys vam crear aquesta iniciativa a BOAP que treballa per aquí a Catalunya i vam fer algunes coses també a Madrid per ajudar els immigrants, sobretot els refugiats que arriben dels països àrabs a l'integració, utilitzant tot el legam andalús i tot. Però també quan van començar a arribar els refugiats ucranians, vam fer també aquesta iniciativa amb refugiats ucranians. Nosaltres cada setmana aquí a Barcelona tenim moltes events, sobretot fem visites guiades, portem la gent, els refugiats, a concerts, al Palau de la Música, al Liceu, tot amb la facilitació d'Aprova Cultura, que és una identitat social, cultural fantàstica aquí a Barcelona. Treballem, també portem a la Sagrada Família, vam participar amb uns ONGs ucranians aquí a Barcelona de fer el Festival de la Cultura Cultura de la cultura ucraniana, és molt important utilitzar el patrimoni pels refugiats. Els refugiats necessiten aquesta eina per el seu benestar, per també la integració, que nosaltres quan portem els nens ucranians o àrabs als museus, fem tallers, tot... Tot això ajuda molt a la gent per recuperar el seu autoestima i també per... A BOAP encara és una iniciativa voluntària. Nosaltres estem intentant buscar finançament per poder portar aquesta iniciativa endavant i el nostre objectiu és també fer-la en diversos països europeus on hi ha refugiats ucranians. Ara, amb tot el que està passant, i amb tot el problema de l'electricitat i de el que, bueno, ja està previst que molts refugiats arribaran. I esperem que aquesta cosa, que amb això, bueno, a Barcelona hem vist que està funcionant molt, molt, molt bé i està ajudant molta gent i esperem que continuem fent aquestes iniciatives amb els refugiats. Moltes gràcies. Moltes gràcies, Isbert. Ara donem pas a l'últim participant de la taula d'experiències. És el Sebastián Sijotski. Participarà online des de Polònia. Esperem que estigui a punt ja la connexió. No sé si... Si m'avisen des de control... 
Ah, mira, sí, es que el bus que va aquí darrere. Molt bé. Hola, Sebastián, bon dia. Moltes gràcies per acompanyar-nos des de Polònia. El Sebastián Sijotski és conservador en cap i responsable de recerca del Museu d'Art Modern de Varsòvia. És comissari d'EVA Internacional 2023, la principal vianal d'art contemporani d'Irlanda, i ha estat responsable de nombroses exposicions. També ha estat comissari dels pavellons de Polònia a la Bienal de Venècia 2007 i 2011. És membre de The Sunflowers, el centre comunitari solidari del Museu d'Art Modern de Varsòvia, una iniciativa d'ajuda, cultura i contrapropaganda per a aquells que han viscut la invasió russa a Ucraïna. Ha participat en diverses conferències internacionals i és autor de nombroses publicacions. Moltes gràcies, Sebastián, i endavant. Uh, thank you so much for hosting me. This is really like an amazing opportunity to talk to so many wonderful colleagues and uh, professionals from all over the world, both uh, online and uh, here, like in Barcelona. Uh, my proposal is to share uh, a few slides and kind of delineate my experience of working in the museum modern art in Warsaw, uh, facing different problems, but trying to kind of contextualize, to kind of embed it in the history of museums and all those moments when museums became something else, when museums started to function as uh, food banks, as, as sanctuaries, as safe places for different communities. So uh, I would like to share my screen, to share my little presentation and um, just let me know if you can see it. Uh, yeah, this is my screen. Yeah, it's working. Can you can you see? That? Yeah, I can see. I can see on the screen. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I will start with a little bit of a kind of like a metaphor, a little drawing uh, from Krzysztof Peda, a Polish designer with whom I was working on kind of illustrating certain evolutions like metamorphosis of an institution of a museum, how a museum as a concept as a, as a concept changed uh, in the 20th and the 21st century because of different like critical moments like those historical turbulences, dis disturbances which change the function of an institution which was somehow settling down in the 19th century. And uh, this is a simple drawing with uh, which I really like, which really epitomizes the spirit of our institutions nowadays, a uh, box with those finger fingerprints. Uh, so the traces of people who are using, uh, using the structure, the infrastructure of the museum, sometimes like abusing it, like stretching it, stretching boundaries and uh, creating something else, creating other functions, uh, opening up other possibilities for the museum. So I, I guess the, the symbol of a fingerprint in a clinical white cube of a museum is quite symptomatic and meaningful. And uh, as we all know, the, the, the concept of a museum is very much embedded in this 19th century notions of, of authorship, of the singularity of the work, of the, first of all, of the role of the spectator, of the viewer, which is very much limited. Don't touch it. Don't sleep here. You know, don't lie down. Don't eat it. You know, there are many like, regulations of what we can do and we cannot do in the museum. But uh, all those like barriers, all those obstacles are being questioned in the times of a crisis, such a crisis as we are facing now, both the military uh, invasion of Russia in Ukraine and, in, uh, and other military conflicts still ongoing, including, including also like the refugee crisis on the Poland-Belarus border, still unresolved, still, still ongoing. And, uh, and Apparently, the, the, the bigger crisis of them all, which is the climate crisis, uh, 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 danger to the to not only to the to the human uh, species, but it's also to the whole uh, kind of planetary uh, system. 
Uh, and this is more also like the other metaphor, the endospore. It's a it's a it's a term in biology which I kind of I'm keen to compare to to this development uh, of a museum. An, an endospore. It's a it's a very specific form of a living being of a bacteria, which in the times of like an extreme conditions, uh, st stopped stops being like. Uh, uh, stops its functions, you know, so it doesn't reproduce. You know, like it doesn't move. Uh, it tries to survive in order to flourish again in the in the in the future. I guess it's like a very handy metaphor for museums and for what is happening nowadays. Uh, this is an image from the Queen's Museum, which during the pandemic was functioning as a as a, as a food bank, as a food distribution center, uh, providing necessary products to the to the neighborhood, to the to the local communities. But uh, the Queen's Museum is quite a good example of of an institution which is like keeping those relationships, keeping those ties with like very diverse communities. Changing, transforming into into something else when it's necessary. So museums were uh, in the in the last decade they were like very often like functioning as a kind of also an information center, as places where uh, the knowledge was being distributed, also like the information about like those uh, vernacular. Uh, forms of, of culture flourishing in such places as as the Calais, uh, the so-called the jungle, the refugee uh, refugee uh, center. Uh, so uh, for for me, it's also like very important to look at our experience experience nowadays. This is what we are facing here in Poland, for example, when many cultural institutions are serving as, as refugee centers. And we have heard about like many wonderful examples from other countries. Uh, it's, it's quite important to look at it, at look at those precious moments as a certain trajectory, as a long-term uh, history of uh, solidarity gestures of moments when, when when the museum directors when the art workers when people when museum employees decide that this is the moment to open up to kind of change the function to be an endospore using like this uh, this biological metaphor of 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 an entirety of a being which is which is trying to survive but also like to adjust to to to, uh, to kind of mutate into something which is more like uh, uh, capable of surviving, but also serving the local communities. This is a beautiful painting, which you can see from Sven Svet Eriksson, a Swedish painter who was commemorating the, also like one of those moments in the history of art institutions when uh, Malmö Kunstmuseum, the art museum in Malmö in Sweden, became a refugee center. It was a moment when the, when the director of, of, of the museum, Ernst Fischer, decided to uh, open up to, uh, to, to many female former concentration camps uh, uh, prisoners from such places as Ravensbrück, uh, or a brutal uh, place where brutal environment when like medical tests were carried on the on the on, on the prisoners so uh for six months uh place uh this uh art uh sanctuary so to speak became like a human sanctuary became a safe place uh bank uh, beds were installed in the exhibition rooms the kitchen was uh, functioning fully, so the the, the 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 refugees, the former prisoners, were cooking there, were sleeping in the exhibition, but they were also like, modifying the museum. It's also like a, it's a very interesting moment to kind of reflect on the changing of the status of some of the objects in the museum, how things were. Uh, kind of morphing into something else. The photo which you can see here is an altar. This is a place where those uh, prisoners, the former prisoners, were praying. They were like worshiping uh, using the objects found in the museum. So you have like this amazing kind of metamorphosis and also like this very like 
this flickering status of a thing. You have a, 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 an object, a sculpture, which was, which was a religious uh, object of cult, which was in the church, which was like displayed in the church in the past. Then it became uh, an exhibit, a museum exhibit. It was shown on a pedestal in a museum of art. Then the, those, those prisoners came and they changed the status of the thing again. They brought the object, they installed it again, they arranged the, the, the whole like an installation and they treated it as an object of cult again. So you can see how the function of the museum may change, but also how those objects may be activated and restaged and revived, so to speak. If we if we think about like dead objects, about like this kind of uh, uh, situation of a mortuary, you know, like this kind of institutional critique of the 70s, uh, museums are dead spaces. You can see the quite a beautiful example of kind of reviving the thing, you know, like bringing back the object and, and uh, making use of it. So this is like the use value of the thing. And one of the one of the prisoners who ended up in this in this in the, in the museum in Sweden was was Maya Berezov, a Polish uh, artist who was imprisoned of because of her caricatures of Adolf Hitler, which were published in the in the 1930s in one of the French uh, satirical magazines. So you can see that that, that uh, Maya Berezovska was still like bringing those memories of being in a concentration camp while settling down in a museum. So those drawings, uh, uh, you know, reviving those, those memories that are still in the, in the collection. So they're like, you know, like the evidence material, those painful years, but they are also like the evidence material solidarity gesture of the museum, which created like this safe space for those prisoners and which were like also like helping them to recover for those uh, traumas of, of, of being a, a prisoner of a concentration camp in Ravensbrück. And uh, just a few more images of, of, of situations where uh, museums became uh, something else before I will, uh, uh, you know, like conclude with some images from, from Warsaw, from our activities. Uh, this, is, this is 1968, the Moderna Museum, the Museum of Modern Art in Sweden, transformed into a huge, uh, huge playground. Uh, uh, which is, which is uh, like a kind of like a junk playground, as they called it, you know, like this very messy uh, environment for children with uh, building materials, uh, different tools, uh, loudspeakers, and uh, all those, you know, like tracks and uh, concrete and uh, wooden pieces, which were activating the museum in a completely different way as a cheerful, vibrant place for discovering things, uh, for learning, exchanging knowledge, uh, uh, something which is can be understand and can be like also interpreted in the in the spirit of uh, uh, of, of, of this avant-garde dream. You know, this is something which was uh, kind of celebrated in the history of the uh, all the avant-garde of the 20th century, that the museum might be closer to life, closer to our everyday experience. So uh, the art is not like separated by the museum from our everyday uh, activities, such as eating, gathering, partying, playing, but this is a part of our like everyday experience. Uh, so also like the 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 the, the way how how the uh, modern art in Rio, Rio de Janeiro in the seventies is being activated as a way of like expressing like the freedom of speech you know in the very middle of a military dictatorship with so called uh, Sundays of creations when people were like gathering playing uh, playing with different materials like fabric paper but also voices so they were like using bodies. Uh, to express to express their like autonomy, the autonomy of the body, the autonomy of the of the voice, and this is finally, this is this is our temporary space. I'm talking to you just from this the same the same place. It's a block 
but from the 70s, in the very middle of, of Warsaw, next to the Palace of Culture, uh, very close to the railway station. And this is our temporary place. We're just moving to a museum in 2023 and opening in 2024. This is like a museum under construction. And we're like occupying uh, the ground floor of a block of flats, apart from some other venues, but this is like our headquarters. This is where our offices are located. And sometimes we also like do exhibitions there. In February 2023, uh, this place became the sunflower. The sunflower is the name of a, of a kind of like a health aid center, a refugee center, uh, taking its name from uh, a kind of like an anecdote, but also like the sunflower is being celebrated. It's like a national national plant in uh, in Ukraine. But there were like so many stories, so many like. Uh, uh, viral YouTube kind of films, like showing the story of a, of, a, of, a, uh, of an older woman proposing the seeds of a sunflower to a Russian soldier, uh, saying that he should keep them in the pockets so when he dies, at least he will be um, that those plants will be like growing on his back and decomposing his corpse. So the sunflower is like a symbol of, of, of like the autonomy, of uh, independence, of uh, bravery. And we took this, this symbol as a very, also like a very cheerful, like the little sun, you know, like which is glowing. The sunflower symbol as, as also almost like a mascot for our activities. So for the... For those first weeks of the war, the, the museum became uh, a center where, like this very, uh, you know, rapid reaction help was delivered. Uh, you have to kind of uh, take into consideration that uh, the, the population of Warsaw increased by almost like twenty percent in the first months of the war. So it means like every fifth person was was a uh, refugee from ukraine and uh so it required a lot of effort from uh, many different uh, communities uh, individuals uh, groups uh providing for example sandwiches for all those people who were like getting stuck at the railway stations uh, so like thousands of sandwiches every day by, by by volunteers who were like just gathering in the in the museum but it was also like functioning the museum functioned as a as a place of distributing uh, medical supplies also like military vests and helmets uh, um, you know sanitary uh, products uh, all the things which were like necessary but then like the museum became became uh, much more kind of like settling down transforming into more like a cultural center but also like a more like an immaterial service uh, a platform uh, i'm talking about uh, uh, the legal service like legal legal advice which was uh, provided by the by the museum and by the sunflower community lawyers who are like you know advising uh, the refugees how to settle down in poland uh, get like a job permit and so on but it was also a, a, a quite an incredible moment of like mixing up all those like, competences here you can see a group of photographers like professional photographers who were like serving their serving the community uh, making id photos because it was like quite important for those families coming to war so to get a set of analog photos in order to get a vat number uh, yeah, so to conclude, you know, like we are in a in a in a completely different moment now. Like situation has changed rapidly, and uh, the museum is functioning more like a cultural center now, serving different migrants communities uh, with those like film screenings, uh, uh, workshops, language classes, uh, culinary uh, exercises, but also uh, uh, opening to those like completely like non-artistic uh, activities as the as as the pigment here you can you can see an easter uh, ceremony an easter breakfast for the for for the refugees uh, who are like slowly uh, 
adopt uh, adjusting themselves to the situation like getting like uh, uh, jobs and uh, settling down in Poland and also like many people are slowly coming back to the uh, to to Ukraine which uh, of course we understand but we all know it's a long long march you know to the victory it might take many months or even years before the situation will be stabilized so for for the museum it was like a very like important but also like a kind of a painful experience of of kind of getting rid of all the other programs you know and completely like focusing on this on this like a helping service thank you so this is this is my uh, kind of uh, report from from the Warsaw headquarters. Thank you so much. Moltes gràcies, Sebastian. Uh, si et quedes amb nosaltres uns minutets per veure si hi ha alguna pregunta aquí a la sala o, o, o a través del Zoom. A la sala, no sé si hi ha preguntes. Sembla que no t'has deixat molt impactat en, to, en tot el que feu a, a Varsòvia. Eh, Marta, no sé si pel Zoom hi ha algun comentari o alguna pregunta. Em diuen, em diuen que no. Jo doncs, simplement fer un, una reflexió final. I, bé, mm, començant per l'Anastàsia, no? que m'ha mm, bueno, impactat molt també la denúncia que ha fet de, del que és el, la destrucció de tots els elements simbòlics d'una cultura i que és una, és una destrucció igualment fregant i, 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 de, i molt destructiva, no només de, de fet de destruir, de, de, de que afecti la població, sinó tot el que és la destrucció de la cultura, és una destrucció silenciosa que també implica una, una manera d'aniquilació i molt important. Um, el Sabrin, Elisabet Sabrin, ens ha posat molt de manifest la importància de, la, de comptar la població local amb la població civil i la força que té la població civil per recuperar tota, tota la, tots els elements culturals que estan en procés de destrucció. Vull dir que aquesta, la força de la, de la població civil és molt important més enllà de, de, del que es fa des dels estaments governamentals. I el, el Sebastián també ens ha posat de relleu no, que els museus som institucions vives, no ens hem d'oblidar que el patrimoni més enllà de, de les funcions que tenim de, de conservar i de preservar de cara a les generacions futures no, aquests elements que són identitaris i que és molt important mantenir-los, però que hem de tenir aquesta capacitat de ser flexibles i d'adaptar-nos a les noves necessitats i, i que siguin realment institucions al servei de la societat. Eh, moltes gràcies a tots tres i, i ara donarem pas a la ponent, al Peter Stone, que finalment ha arribat i passarem a la, a la ponència final. Després del Peter ja podrem anar a dinar. Gràcies. Bé, doncs donem la benvinguda a en Peter Stone, que no vull pensar com deu estar, perquè quan passen aquestes coses doncs no ho vivim com podem, no? I li agraïm molt l'esforç d'estar de, aquí amb nosaltres i que mantingui aquesta calma i tranquil·litat que sempre s'agraeix 
perquè és el que a mi mateixa ara m'està transmetent. Bé, la seva ponència d'avui és sobre la protecció proactiva dels museus i del patrimoni en cas de conflicte armat. En Peter Stone és càtedra UNESCO de Protecció de Béns Culturals i Pau de la Universitat de Newcastle i president de l'Escut Blau Internacional. És arqueòleg i professor d'Història a English Heritage. El 1997 es va incorporar a la Universitat de Newcastle. Ha estat director general honorari del Congrés Arqueològic Mundial des del 1998 fins al 2008. El 2016 va assumir la càtedra UNESCO de Protecció de Béns Culturals i Pau i el 2020 va ser escollit president de l'Escut Blau Internacional. Ha treballat àmpliament per la protecció del patrimoni en conflictes armats, catàstrofes naturals i crisis humanitàries i és autor de nombroses publicacions. Moltes gràcies, Peter, i endavant. Gràcies molt i m'agradaria moltes gràcies Apologies for my late arrival um, caused by my first flight yesterday being delayed, which meant I missed my second flight, um, which therefore meant I got up at half past four this morning. So if I fall asleep while I'm talking, please just leave quietly. Um, but it, I then got on the flight um, this morning and we were all sitting on the aeroplane and we realized there was a slight commotion going on halfway down the aeroplane as the police arrived to forcibly remove a passenger who didn't want to be removed from the plane. So that took about an hour. So um, my apologies for being late. My thanks to the organizers for bearing with me and reorganizing the, um, the order and for the invitation originally. Um, before I show my slides, I want to apologize about one of them. Um, we are talking about armed conflict, and there is a slide which epitomizes one of the major points that I'm going to make, so um, we'll get that um, later. And I give you a, a brief warning now um, that there is a, a short interactive bit in um, the presentation because for those of you who represent local museums, and can I just, could you just put your hands up, how many of you actually do represent museums in the area? Good, most of you, okay. So there's gonna be a, a quick interactive bit where I ask you some questions, um, and I will just take some very, um, very quick ideas. So, um, without further ado, um, I think you've heard about most of this. I am something called the UNESCO Chair in Cultural Property Protection and Peace, which is this logo on this side of the um, slides. And the university has funded my post and two, uh, one and a half others since 2017. And those one and a half provide the secretariat for the other logo, um, Blue Shield International. And, um, the university is now the largest funder globally um, of the Blue Shield movement, which is something that obviously cannot continue, and I'll mention that in a minute. The issue, and um, obviously some of these slides were there meant for introductions um, to the ideas that we're talking about, um, so we're going over ground, I'm sure, but the issue is that cultural property in um, heritage sites, buildings, libraries, archives, museums, galleries, etc., is damaged and destroyed during conflict. And there are usually three reactions to that. Nothing can be done about it, it's war. Protecting people is far more important than protecting old ruins. And there is no time to protect cultural heritage when we're fighting a war. And an epitome of that is the image um, on the slide uh, with one of the looted storerooms in the National Museum of um, Iraq in Baghdad back in 2003. I would argue that those assertions and claims are not correct. Cultural heritage can be protected if the process is started in peacetime. But it can't just be left to those of you in the room, the heritage sector, it has to be a full government, multi-sector responsibility. It mustn't be seen as a burden to the military, but as an integral part of their responsibilities and practice 
in, in what the military term a force multiplier, something that may make their job easier because they are doing it, even though it's not a normal military practice. And it must be seen also as a humanitarian aspect of their work. And protecting people and their heritage are indivisibly intertwined. So, just to emphasise that last point, the indivisibility between the protection of people and the protection of their heritage, the international community in the um, 20th century failed perhaps three times. Um, firstly, there was the failure of the royalty to stop the First World War and the massive destruction during that war. As a result of that, at the end of the First World War, the international community came together and created the League of Nations, which was supposed to stop war in the future. And very, very simplistically, the League of Nations was based on politics and economics. And the League of Nations failed completely to stop the Second World War. So towards the end of the Second World War, the international community decided that the League would be disbanded and they would create something called the United Nations. But the massive difference between the League of Nations and the United Nations was that the United Nations was going to be based on humanity's moral and intellectual solidarity. Yes, politics, yes, economics, but that um, solidarity through human, moral and intellectual thought, epitomised by the creation of the UN agency UNESCO in 1945, which was um, to create global peace through science, culture and education. In 1945, for the first time, 45-46, the, those who lost the conflict um, were, in some instances, prosecuted not only for heinous crimes of genocide, but also for the destruction of cultural property for the first time. In 1948, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights identifies in Article 7 right to culture and, by implication, right to access of cultural heritage. Perhaps the most important and interesting um, one of these is the Genocide Convention. Genocide was a word that didn't exist in, uh, before the late 1930s when it was invented by a man called Rafał Lemkin, a Polish Jew. And Lemkin got out of Poland just in time. Um, the rest of his family were all killed in the extermination camps. But Lemkin escaped and got to the, um, the Americas and um, he had already been working on the concept of genocide in relation to the Armenian genocide in the First World War. And then, of course, he was given the um, example of the Holocaust in the second. Um, but Lemkin divided genocide into two parts, barbarism and vandalism. Barbarism, genocide against people. Vandalism, which usually came before barbarism, genocide of their cultural property, the destruction of their cultural property. And in the first drafts of the 48 Genocide Convention, both of those had chapters on their own in the convention. At the, the last meetings, um, vandalism was removed from the convention at the insistence of the so-called settler states, um, America, Canada, Australia, um, New Zealand to a lesser extent, supported by ex-colonial powers like the UK, I'm sorry, um, because they thought it would be used against them in their treatment and ongoing treatment of indigenous communities in their countries. So that was taken away. But at the same time, there was the preparation thinking for the most important bit of international humanitarian law, the 1954 Hague Convention on the Protection of Cultural Property in the Event of Armed Conflict and its two protocols. And that same idea of prosecuting people who had been responsible for destruction, of 
the two elements being intertwined was written and is in almost every sentence of the 54 Hague Convention. And at the conference preparing the convention and the final text, it was envisaged that, and I quote, that there would be established a red cross for cultural property to balance the International Committee for the Red Cross. Unfortunately, that never happened or didn't happen in 19. Um, 54. But none of those ideas were new. Uh, we haven't got time to go through this, but take my word for it, they had all been around for about two and a half thousand years with the writings of Sun Shou in um, 6th century BC China um, through Polybus, the Greek historian, Hugo Grotus from the Netherlands, um, von Clausewitz, and Francis Lieber um, in the middle in the American Civil War. And the American Civil War was one of the first times that protection of cultural property um, was codified um, since the um, 13th century in military thinking. So let's just take a step back. Why is all of this important and, um, and crucial? So it, cultural property, I mean, we all know this, but let's just put it down on on words or in words, it provides the tangible and intangible link to the past that helps individuals and communities create a sense of place, identity and belonging. Yes, we must always put the safety and social, mental and economic well-being of people first, but that well-being is completely interrelated with the protection of their heritage. And what we are driving at as Blue Shield is either building or maintaining healthy, peaceful, stable, sustainable communities. Because it is only through having those that you have society having those same attributes, which is the first building block of the aspirations of UNESCO back in 1945, world peace. But of course there is a health warning and we've already heard about that in the last uh, presentations. It defines who we are but of course who we're not, who belongs and who does not belong, who is included and who is excluded. It can be used as a vehicle for understanding, mutual recognition and peace building but it can also be used diametrically opposite as an excuse for tool of and target in war, as we've seen in the fighting in the former Yugoslavia, in the ISIS attacks, which um, we've seen images of, um, of the Rohingya um, in Myanmar and the current, of course, Ukrainian conflict. But we must therefore be aware of both the opportunity and the threat that cultural heritage and cultural property provides. And so my apologies for this slide, but this epitomizes that whole mix and interrelationship, okay? So the population of the village of Broko in former Yugoslavia was rounded up, taken two miles away from their village and machine gunned into a trench that had just been dug for that purpose. But the trench was then not filled up with the earth that had come out of the trench. It was actually filled in with the rubble of the mosque of the people of Brocco. The mosque was completely destroyed and as an archaeologist I would say taken down to natural. So there was no chance of an archaeological excavation in five days or 500 years revealing the footprint of a mosque. Complete eradication of people and their heritage as if they had never been there, buried together, never to be seen again. The indivisibility of protection of people and the protection of their heritage. I'm not going to go through this, but you can see um, 
on the slide a number of different laws that have been there since the late 19th century, um, and in particular the 1954 Hague Convention, which is the primary piece of international humanitarian law, um, but then additional protocols to the Geneva Conventions, the 1998 Rome Statute, which created the International Criminal Court, numerous UN Security Council resolutions, um, probably the most important, 2347, um, and various other international and national instruments and declarations. There is a ton of this and there are a ton of books written on it. Um, that's the only slide about it that I'm going to show you, other than just picking up some of the key points of the 54 Hague Convention. So, in peacetime, countries, or what they are called high contracting parties to the Hague Convention, have got a series of things that they should do. Firstly, to produce a list of cultural property that they want to be protected, and I'll come back to a little of that later. To identify cultural property under three headings, and again, I'll come back to that in the next slide. To put in emergency plans to protect cultural property in conflict, um, in situ and, if possible, movable. To, design, uh, to um, define and identify what the, is called in the Convention um, competent authorities to protect all of this and deliver all of that. To mark Blue Shield, uh, sorry, to mark cultural property with the Blue Shield emblem. And then critically, but frequently forgotten, um, Article 7 talks specifically about the military obligations and responsibilities under the Convention. And there are two in particular, that in military regulations, everybody in uniform had to understand the importance of protection of cultural property. And in some form, a specialist unit or capability should be created in the military. All of that had to happen in peace. If you did it, try or try to instigate that during a conflict, it was too late and nothing would happen. And so this is the, um, that regime of value as it's called. So, I don't know if this, no, I can't. Oh, wait a minute. I can't um, point to it, but the, if you look at, it's gone again. If you look at um, this side, um, you see three levels of importance. I'm not even touching it. <laughs> okay, great importance. So everything protected under the Hay Convention must be of at least great importance. And then there are two other elements, very great importance, which is special protection, and then the greatest importance, enhanced protection. I'm not going to go through all of those things, but the key thing to pick out from the other side is that they have specific military responsibilities at different levels, okay? So an attack on any of those has to be done at either battalion, low level, divisional, or if enhanced, the whole force commander. But the key bit is most of the heritage, therefore, in any country, is not actually protected under Hague. It's underneath that. And the issue that is constantly asked of me by, um, in particular, one um, British military officer, a tank commander, he wants to know where he can park his tanks in that village without causing offence. And that's the key to understanding the good cultural property protection. And I'll come back to that. Okay, this slide wants to be shown. Um, and it underlines the whole of the problem. In February of this year, nobody in Ukraine believed that there was going to be a Russian invasion. And so, with some notable exceptions, nobody was prepared for it. And at the same time, and in the same way as Af in Afghanistan the year before, the government 
stopped people moving or bagging up collections because it would send the wrong message to the population. The Afghan government didn't believe that the Taliban were going to get back into control and the um, Ukrainian government really didn't believe that there was actually going to be an invasion. So we were, they were not ready. So the interactive bit, are you prepared? So if you just would like to put your hands up, if you can say yes to some of these questions. So firstly, have you got a full catalogue of your collection, including good photographs of everything? Who wants to claim that? Two out of about 30, three, okay. Don't feel embarrassed or anything. I do this quite frequently and I get almost exactly the same result. Um, is it kept safe with multiple copies and are those constantly updated? Nobody wants to claim that. Do you have a disaster risk reduction plan? Nobody. One, two, okay. Does it include armed conflict? Okay, I guess that one. Who's going to help you protect it? Have you got people there um, to help? No? Okay. Um, in the image, you have um, members of the general public in Cairo in Egypt who were there protecting the National Museum from rioting um, at the beginning of the uh, Arab Spring. Do you have a priority grab list for objects in your museum? What are the most important things you definitely want? No, okay. Have you got all the packing material in the boxes that you need to pack up your collection or even just the top bits? One, thank you. If you're going to evacuate your collection, have you got the plan? Do you know where it's going to go? Nobody. And how would it get there? Probably, I would guess, none of you. Okay, don't worry. Though, oh, sorry, and have you thought about cyber attacks? One of the biggest threats at the moment to heritage and culture are cyber attacks. As just one example, the Blue Shield redid our website um, now about six months ago. In the first week, we had 360,000 cyber attacks on our site. They all came from, or the majority came from one country, and we have no idea whether there were a load of people in a room typing cyber attacks into the system or whether it was just a robot doing them all, but we had 360,000. We're now down to um, in the few tens of thousands a week of cyber attacks. It's a real threat. So it must, preparation is crucial. It must be a peacetime activity. Um, you must understand there is responsibilities. If you don't, it won't happen. One example of really good cultural property protection, you have to go back to the First World War and the um, British occupation, conquering, liberation, whichever word you want to choose, of Jerusalem. And the British government was terrified of the predominantly Islamic population of Jerusalem rising up against the British occupation. Not particularly because of any issues that would happen in Jerusalem, but because that might then be replicated in British India. And that might open up a completely new front in the First World War. And so it was essential to keep everything calm in the Middle East so as not to provoke um, a rising up of the Islamic population in India. Um, so 
the government wrote this um, a proclamation for Field Marshal Allenby that everything of all of the three major religions would be protected by Allenby's men. And that was really good cultural property protection because it immediately took away a potential threat and a potential rallying cry for the Islamic population in Jerusalem. But then somebody on Allenby's staff turned really good cultural property protection into brilliant cultural property protection because they used Muslim troops from battalions in the Indian army that were under Allenby's control to protect all of the Islamic sites. And with that one simple decision, they disarmed any opposition from the Islamic community and while the military were in charge of Jerusalem, there was no opposition. When the politicians took over, that became a different issue. But that was brilliant cultural property protection. Wind that forward to 2002 and three, when there were six so-called think tanks created in Washington to protect cultural, uh, sorry, to plan for post-Saddam Iraq. One of them had a subcommittee on the whole of culture. That subcommittee did not meet. No troops were given any orders to protect any culture or any heritage. And as a result, none of them did. And as a result, they were all looted. And the tipping point from most commentators' point of view of a population in Iraq increasingly fed up with the coalition still being there to the full-scale sectarian civil war that required the coalition troops to stay taking five more years worth of casualties and fatalities was the um, attack on the Al-Aqshiri Mosque in Samarra. But while the casualties and the fatalities were bad enough, the real failure as a result of that was the, the allowed the re-emergence of um, Al-Qaeda in Iraq and it provided the oxygen for the emergence of the so-called Islamic State. The military, the West, lost that media war and that was the, the really critical element. So, let's go back to 1945 and that aspiration for a Red Cross for cultural property, which eventually was created in um, 1996, only 42 years late. And um, my guess, we haven't got all of the documentation to um, claim this categorically, but my guess that it wasn't created in 54 was simply nobody was prepared to pay for it. And that was the same thing in 1996. Um, it was created by the four um, heritage organizations, ICOM, ICOMOS, IFLA and ICA, um, libraries and archives, the last two. And um, Blue Shield comprises those founding four organizations plus now 30 national committees with another 15 under preparation and together they elect an international board and a president um, and that's together with the secretariat called Blue Shield um, International. Our mission moves away from the very object orientated language of the actual 54 convention. We're committed to the protection of the world's cultural property, as stated in the Convention, but also concerned with the protection of cultural and natural heritage. It is only the West that makes that distinction. Nowhere else in the world makes that distinction. Tangible and intangible in the event of armed conflict or following human-made or natural disaster. And there in the image, you see the Argentinian National Committee who convinced their um, public TV station to do a series of six programs on cultural property protection. Our end goal, as I've said already, is the creation of those healthy, peaceful, stable, sustainable communities. Primary context is the 54 Convention underpinned by that list of wider international law and, and other elements. 
Also conscious, though, of the Sustainable Development Goals and um, uh, uh, documents such as the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction. And we see it as a multi-sector responsibility and opportunity. And there's one of my colleagues, or now ex-colleagues, he's retired, um, uh, ex-Lieutenant Colonel Paul Fox, but also Dr. Paul Fox with a um, PhD in art history. Um, and so understanding the language of both the heritage sector and the military, um, talking in a NATO exercise um, to colleagues there. So we need partners in the, what we call the uniform sector, not just the military, but customs, border control, police, etc. cetera, um, the humanitarian sector, and of course the heritage sector. Um, but we need to understand the political and legal and media environment about how all that happens. And we have developed a series of formal partnerships because back in 2003, when I first got involved in this, my immediate question was, well, surely this is done by the ICRC. And the ICRC's response was, no, we have want nothing to do with it. We only look after people. Um, there. And in the image, you see us training the Irish Defence Forces um, who only deploy as UN peacekeepers. We envisage that responsibility, we envisage the Blue Shield as this triangle set within a circle. The triangle, as with all good self-respecting triangles, has three points, those three sectors. But as put to me by a colonel in the US Army last year, oh, I get it, sir, the space in the triangle is where there are no stupid questions. And he got it in one. Because those three sectors all start off from completely different starting points. But they all have, in Blue Shield language, that aspiration of healthy, peaceful, stable, sustainable communities. Because once they've achieved those, the uniform sector can go home, the humanitarians can go home, and the heritage sector can get on with whatever the heritage sector wants to get on with. But without that relationship, without that development of partnership, it won't happen. And then in the broader circle, the political agendas, the legal responsibilities and obligations, the crucial impact of media, and then why we do it all for communities. A key issue which doesn't go down well with some people, but Blue Shield is an independent, impartial and neutral organisation. We will not and do not point a finger at blame of anybody in any conflict. All we ask is for any party to a conflict, be that state on state or state versus armed non-state actors, as they're called, um, is for those people to work under the conventions, under international humanitarian law, with their responsibilities regarding the protection of cultural property. So we have not, and we will not, point a finger of blame at the Russian Federation. And the reason for that, it enables us to work behind the scenes with all parties to a conflict. Now, in the current situation in Ukraine, we are working far more closely and in more detail um, with one side than the other, but we are in contact with both sides. Um, we understand, however, that our national committees may not have that flexibility or that um, opportunity. Um, frustratingly, at the end of last year, we were beginning to talk to colleagues in the Ukraine about the creation of a Ukrainian National Committee of the Blue Shield. Had that actually happened and not been overtaken by events, there would have been no way that we would have expected the Ukrainian National Committee to maintain the mantra of independence, impartiality and neutrality. They had been invaded. So you can see that, but equally I hope you can see the advantage of working um, in our way. Um, we have something called the Blue Shield approach, which talks about how and why we do things. And it's supposed to provide 
um, a national flexibility within a common framework. And the image there, you've got my colleague Emma Cunliffe working again with a multinational NATO tabletop exercise in this um, instance um, on uh, adding in cultural property problems to a military exercise. So the approach has seven elements. Um, the five issues are simply the five most frequently asked questions. So um, who, isn't it more important to have people protected than their heritage? Yes, obviously, but the two are indivisible. Do you call it cultural property or do you call it cultural heritage? You can call it whatever you want because if we all know what we're talking about, it doesn't matter, and questions like that. The Strasbourg Charter gives us that impartiality, independence, and neutrality. The mission statement you've already seen. The four-tier approach are the four times that the Blue Shield and the heritage community need to interact with those other two sectors. Um, Long-term education, immediately pre-deployment um, to a particular country. What is the heritage in that country? What does it look like? Who may help you? Who may hinder you in um, trying to protect it? During the conflict, um, the military and others need what they call reach back. Um, they want to take a photograph of something and know within maximum 24 hours if it's real or if it is as the guy driving the car full of stuff claims this is just made, um, recently made for the tourists and it's made to look old, honestly. Um, it isn't really 4,000 years old. But they need that information from um, experts um, that we can provide. And then um, immediately post-conflict, the stabilization phase of activity. So those are the four times. We then have the six areas of activity that we ask all national committees and Blue Shield International to plan to and report on on an annual basis. They don't have to do it in this order. They can prioritize in the order that is most suitable to their national situation. And they don't have to deal with all six in any one year. So it may be that you're only gonna do, um, you know, focus on the second one, legal compliance, if your country hasn't either ratified the 54 convention or one or both of its protocols. But that gives that common framework showing that the organization is roughly the same across the world. We've identified eight threats to cultural property. When I first got involved in this, everybody told me, Pete, don't worry about it. It's a war, it's a conflict, things get blown up. Well, yes, that's true. But if the biggest threat is lack of planning, if you don't plan, if you don't think about it beforehand, as the politicians in London and Allenby's staff did in Jerusalem in 1917, then you will have the chaos that resulted from lack of planning and lack of thinking in 2002 and 2003. That lack of awareness, if you haven't had the military go through that four-tier approach, and then I'm not going to go through the others, they're on our website um, there, and that's me um, on an actual exercise um, playing a local community um, person briefing one army, um, in fact, uh, officers from seven different countries um, taking part in the training um, about a damage done to a church. Um, and then the seven reasons that the uniformed and the humanitarian sectors can't actually say this has got nothing to do with us. And the first one of those for the uniformed is that the UN Security Council very explicitly say this is a security issue, therefore it is directly related to the uniform sector. Um, the second one, directly targeting the humanitarians, it's there, and again, it's the legal responsibilities, the potential use as politics, um, looting will fund um, things. Um, 
if anybody believes how much um, money comes from looting, um, it probably doesn't work. Um, but any small amount is damaging to a military uh, conflict and economic viability and soft power. So very quickly, some things that we're doing. We're trying to raise awareness with lectures like this. We're building the capacity of national committees. We are working very closely with NATO because NATO not only deals with its own 29 members, but also um, with 40 odd partners. Um, and we're thinking of um, cultural property information, um, exercise input as you've seen um, is going on there on the image there, but not with NATO in this instance, but with um, countries in South America, in Honduras, this image. Um, we're developing um, materials and training courses for UN peacekeepers, and the UN peacekeeping school in Ireland has now committed to running an annual training course um, for officers for CPP. Um, we're developing working relationships with the humanitarian sector, Following the invasion of uh, Ukraine, I've been to Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Romania, Finland remotely, and you can add in, I'm sure, the other countries that I will be going to in the nearest future who are significantly more worried than they were on the 23rd of February. Um, we're working still closely in Afghanistan, and we're looking for funding for a um, team of 12 in the first instance. And very quickly, how are we doing? Um, I think three examples of this. In the NATO air campaign in 2011 in um, Libya, um, as a uh, signatory to the convention, Libya was supposed to have created a list of cultural property. It hadn't, so the, led by the US National Committee of the Blue Shield, supported by the UK National Committee, we created a list that was given to NATO and um, a NATO targeteer sitting in an airfield in the Netherlands identified from satellite imagery six vehicles um, of uh, troops loyal to the, President Gaddafi um, close to and inside a derelict building. I don't know the detail of what happened next but the equivalent of a red light flashed on his or her computer because the coordinates for the derelict building were the same for the Roman fortified farm at Ras al Margheb that we had given them, asking not to damage if at all possible. Um, the decision went up the food chain in NATO and the decision was to change the one large bomb that the targeteer had chosen to destroy the derelict building and all six vehicles um, to six precision weapons. And you can see the tangled mass of metal of one of those and the other five look exactly the same, whereas the Roman building is almost um, as pristine as it was uh, before the attack. That led to something that NATO was very unused to, which was a lot of good publicity globally, um, because we put um, Libyan archaeologists up in front of the international media. And as a result of that, um, NATO is now on the verge of drafting a NATO-wide policy on cultural property protection. Um, and we will be working with them on that in the first half of next year. We've got Finally, we've changed the, the idea and the thinking of the ICRC. So the last thing we did before COVID was go to Geneva um, and sign an MOU with the ICRC. And the then Director General Yves Dacor um, argued that protecting cultural property and cultural heritage against the devastating effects of war unfortunately remains a humanitarian imperative today, perhaps more than ever. So changing the um, views of the, blue, of the Red Cross from 2003 to um, 2020. And then the last example, um, Beirut, and an example of a human caused disaster, not an armed conflict. But we had been working um, with Blue Shield in Lebanon with an NGO called um, Biladi with the UN peacekeeping operation in 
um, Lebanon with the Lebanese Armed Forces, um, LAF, with the Department for Antiquities, the DGA, um, since 2013, training and working with them, introducing them to the, all of the ideas about cultural property protection. That had built seven years of partnership and trust, starting in peacetime. There was the explosion in Beirut. I was talking to colleagues in Blue Shield Lebanon and Biladi four hours after the explosion. The next day they met with the DGA and divided up the, the problems between state-run DGA responsibilities, privately run museums, libraries and archives taken on by Blue Shield Lebanon and Biladi. And very simplistically, um, they did, well, they then did a photographic um, record of the impact of the explosion on all of those buildings. And simplistically, none of them had any windows left. None of them had any doors left. Um, some of them had uh, bits of their roofs damaged, broken pipes, etc. cetera. Um, they all needed securing as quickly as possible. While the people on the ground were doing that in Beirut, I was working with international funding agencies and we um, uh, got together and we had, um, I don't know where that image has gone, let me just see, okay. There is a very nice image I, I will um, uh, describe to you in a moment, but I've been working with international funding agencies and once we'd got the photographic evidence, the next Wednesday, so eight days after the explosion, we had um, a few cents less than 100,000 um, euros to um, secure all of those buildings. Um, we then thought we'd done our job, but then UNIFIL um, were given permission by the United Nations to move out of their area of responsibility in the south of Lebanon, which they have never had responsibility or permission to do before, and go to Beirut to help. And UNIFIL phoned us up and said, okay, we've been working with you guys for seven years. We understand what you do. We understand from what's happened in central Beirut, um, there will be a problems for the heritage sector, how can we help? And because UNIFIL said that, the Lebanese Armed Forces agreed and said, yeah, we're here as well, what can we do to help? And the image that you, for some reason, can't see um, is of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs that had had three quarters of its roof blown away, had taken the brunt of the explosion. And the, in that particular type of architecture, it is the weight of the roof that keeps the building standing. So without three quarters of the roof, the walls of the building were going out at a rate of 20 centimeters a week, and they weren't gonna stay for very long. So with their civil engineers um, and all of their expertise, with their heavy lifting equipment, UNIFIL and LAF together put on a pull the walls back in firstly and then put on a um, temporary roof which stabilizes the building for at least five years and my guess is it will be there for significantly longer while um, the money is found to um, actually refurbish it properly which will be in the millions of euros. Um, but that's the reason that you have to start in peacetime. UNIFIL would have got permission to go and help in Beirut, but had we not been working with them for seven years, there is no way they would have picked up the phone. Exactly the same for the Lebanese Armed Forces. Lebanese Armed Forces are now in the process of creating their own capability as required under the 54 Hague Convention, but as not done by many militaries in the world, of um, developing that capability um, within Lebanese armed forces. That's what the Blue Shield tries to do. Those are the issues we try to address. Thank you very much for listening. I'm happy to answer questions, and I'm sorry I've gone on for about five minutes too long. Thank you.
Moltíssimes gràcies per la seva intervenció. Si teniu alguna pregunta... Gràcies. Jo volia preguntar de les catalogacions de béns que ja estan protegits per llei en la majoria de països, entenc que ja tenen un conjunt de béns protegits. Com hi treballeu amb això? Perquè entenc que ja és una classificació prèvia que teniu per poder treballar, feu llistes noves o treballeu sobre això, més o menys com ho introduïu. Ok, no és una ràpida resposta a això, però com he dit, said um, before, under the 54 Convention, there are three levels of protection. Um, and the uh, state party is supposed to identify which of the properties in their country are going to be, uh, are asked to be put under those three levels. And for the first level, that it will just be accepted by UNESCO. For the next two, special and enhanced, um, it, would have to, it goes through a, a committee process in UNESCO. Um, and the key, one of the key differences between special and advanced is that for, um, sorry, enhan um, enhanced protection has to have a commitment from the country's Ministry of Defense that the site will not be used for any military purpose or to shield any military purpose. So um, those are the, the differences, but there's a, a large bureaucracy and, um, that goes around that. Um, many people criticize the fact that there are these three levels um, and there is a, 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 um, almost an understanding within UNESCO that special protection is no longer something that countries would use. They will just want to have either just general protection or enhanced protection. The problem with that is that special protection is in international humanitarian law. And as you saw from my slide, the military have a particular rank associated with it and the military expect special protection to be used. Thank you so much for your such inter uh, interesting interventions. Um, um, I don't know, it's, um, yes. It's more a uh, comment than a uh, question, because uh, for me, I don't know how, how, to, uh, how to react in this situation. Um, how actually we can uh, do uh, in this situation when your opponent, like Russian Federation, uh, completely ignore, neglect uh, uh, any uh, international law um, any protocols, uh, so um, I don't know, it's challenge or uh, maybe you, I don't know if you, you even uh, able to, to give me an answer right now. No, I mean, it's a, it's a good question. How do you deal with trying to protect cultural property when one side to a conflict um, has no interest in doing so or may even have an interest in specifically targeting that cultural property. Um, and you're right, there is probably very little that you can do during the conflict. If you prepare properly before the conflict, then, and if there is a political will to allow that work to take place, then um, you can mitigate the impact of conflict significantly. So had, um, let's use Afghanistan as the example, but have the Afghan government allowed Afghan museums provincially and in Kabul and all of their art galleries and libraries, etc., to um, not only prepare, which they had done to some extent, but actually to put those preparations into practice by 
removing the collections from display, from moving the collections from the provinces to Kabul um, and elsewhere, um, then a, a significant amount of what we now think has been lost and physically destroyed could have been saved. So that goes back to the cri critical impact of preparing in peacetime. Um, if you then have, if you, if you manage that, if you don't manage that, um, but you then have the, the possibility of um, seeing material damaged and collections damaged and buildings damaged during the conflict, but if enough information is gathered um, on the destruction, on who did the destruction, when and how, then that can be taken into consideration, as it was in Nuremberg, as it was under the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, um, where people were prosecuted and convicted for crimes against um, cultural property, um, and where the most um, famous case recently is the conviction of Mr. Al Mahdi for the intentional destruction of nine mausoleums and a mosque in Timbuktu. Um, Al Mahdi was the um, commanding officer of um, uh, the, I uh, can't remember the, the, the um, actual title of his unit, but the police who was supposed to destroy un Islamic things. Um, and so that was there. Interestingly, Mr. Al Mahdi was going to um, uh, claim innocence until um, the prosecutors showed him videos that he had made um, standing in front of a mausoleum with his um, men, um, explaining why he was just about to give the order um, to destroy it because they were un Islamic, because they were, for the mausoleum, um, uh, in um, and Sandine's view of Islam, there should be no indication of burial above ground. So because these mausoleums were above ground, they all had to be destroyed. But he, in those propaganda videos, provided all of the information that the prosecution needed um, for uh, not only a prosecution, but a conviction. And Al Mahdi is still in prison with a nine year sentence. Um, so there is a, a retribution, if that's the right term, possibility following a conflict of taking perpetrators to um, uh, courts, either national or international. Um, so um, I can imagine that uh, from such huge uh, country as Ukraine, we couldn't actually evacuate whole museums collections, it's impossible, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it's um, also uh, impossible to protect uh, whole uh, historical buildings mm -hmm. because um, our uh, mm -hmm. opponent uh, ignore, ignore the whole marks. Mm -hmm. So right now, if uh, I understand, uh, we uh, only c can uh, collect um, evidence for future uh, yeah, I mean, at, at the moment, um, I mean, again, and I, I don't mean this in any disrespect for, um, you know, Ukraine or Ukrainians, but um, had there been better preparation beforehand, some of the damage could have been mitigated. Um, and there are examples of um, that happening in Syria, for example, where mosaics or frescoes or wall paintings have been protected um, in particular ways. Now, that's not going to stop um, the whole church being blown up, but it will stop damage to a wall um, if, if that is um, a possibility. Uh, but the packing, the identification of the priority objects from a, a museum or an archive. Um, there are some of the work we are doing at the moment with Afghanistan is um, trying to identify, well, trying to find out um, where objects that are now appearing on the so-called licit um, market for antiquities um, are coming from. And 
we we know and work closely with the police in certain countries um, about that, trying to stop those being sold and trying to bring those trying to sell them to some level of justice. So it's, again, um, a retrospective impact. Um, it's not the ideal circumstance, but it's as best we can get. No sé si hay alguna pregunta més a la sala. Si no, al... Sí, la Marta. Hola, buen día. Uh, no es una pregunta, es simplemente uh, una, una felicidad al, al que ha comentado abans el profesor que... Fa pocs dies vaig estar en una jornada online de, que organitzava una associació de museus anglesos i, i es va parlar d'un tema d'un ciberatac a, a un museu d'allà, concretament al Hackney Museum, eh, i, i les persones que portaven la part digital al museu van explicar com sobreviure en ciberatac en, en un museu, per si de cas a algú li passava una cosa semblant, no? a la qual cosa crec que el que estava comentant abans el professor és una amenaça real i ja tenint un cas de estudi que, que s'ha comentat en un congrés i que si després algú vol, pues li, li puc ensenyar. D'acord? Yeah. yeah, thank you. I mean, don't think of a cyber attack just as, um, you know, damaging or destroying your computer network. Um, what the hackers can do is go in and change the records of your museum catalogs. So something that is, you know, um, Ukrainian suddenly becomes a object from Russia. Um, and that may be happening now without anybody realizing it. Um, and it is just going on in the background. Um, there is just the, you know, destruction of catalogs. Because if you don't have a catalog, um, then you're not looking after your collection properly. And that gives somebody else a justification for looking at after for you. Um, and these are, you know, appalling things, but they are intrusive and they are not immediately obvious frequently. Um, and so, you know, perhaps if I was going to get you to do one of those things, it would be at least to talk to whoever is in charge of your websites um, to think about how best to protect those websites and to keep different versions in different places. Don't just say, okay, it's great, it's on the cloud, it's safe. No, it's not. Molt bé. Moltes gràcies. Crec que, te, que hi ha alguna pregunta al, al Zoom. No? No hi ha cap pregunta. Doncs no sé si hi ha alguna altra més aquí a la sala. No, no, molt, molt interessant totes les aportacions que, que ha fet el, el, el doctor Aston, sobretot, bueno, m'he quedat amb algunes idees, la indivisibilitat de la protecció dels pobles i del seu patrimoni. Això és, això és bàsic, ho hem de tenir molt clar. També definir qui som, però també qui no som, és un gran exercici, una reflexió que hem de fer per poder avançar sempre. Ha quedat ben palès la importància de la manca de planificació. Aquest és un, aquesta és una paraula que darrerament, potser més en l'àmbit administratiu o d'intervenció, ens estan uh, dient molt, però també veiem que en el món del patrimoni és importantíssima aquesta planificació en temps de pau. No parlaré molt d'aquest tema perquè aleshores aquí la responsabilitat jo veig més que, que s'aboca cap a les administracions supralocals, que tenim més mitjans, no molts, però tenim més mitjans que, que els que es tenen des del món local. I aquí sí que nosaltres tenim una gran obligació de, de, de posar fil a l'agulla. 
Busca socis, busca socis, ella ha parlat potser més a gran escala, ha parlat dels uniformes, no sé, però potser quan veiem aquesta imatge dels uniformes, cadascú pot tenir la seva connotació més positiva o més negativa, tornem al llenguatge positiu, no? Mirem-ho des del punt de vista positiu, en què ens poden ajudar, perquè al final són els que estan sobre el terreny i els que poden, amb les seves accions, ajudar-nos a protegir el nostre patrimoni. I per fer-ho més, lligant-ho amb la primera ponència, és què podem fer nosaltres davant d'això, en el món local. Fa un parell de setmanes vam assistir al laboratori d'arxius municipals en què justament es parlava de tot el tema dels atacs informàtics que es pateixen a les administracions públiques. Parleu amb els arxivers que teniu als vostres municipis, parleu amb els informàtics, Fem xarxa més enllà del nostre propi sector dels museus. Busquem quines aliances podem establir entre les persones que tenim ben a prop, que sempre intentem anar més enllà quan tenim ben a prop altres persones, eines, que ens poden donar un cop de mà, fins i tot la societat civil, les persones que tenim al voltant, els voluntaris, que segur que amb els seus coneixements ens poden donar un cop de mà en situacions determinades i les accions de sensibilització. Tornem a l'educació, que també he parlat al principi, l'educació. L'educació importantíssima, fonamental, que comença a casa, però segueix a les institucions. Moltes gràcies. Hem gaudit molt de la seva ponència i ja acabem la sessió del matí. Ara tenim un petit refrigeri i continuem per la tarda. Gràcies.